So it's my pleasure now to introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Terje Arven from the University of Stavanger in Norway. Uh, he's a professor of risk analysis in risk analysis and risk management uh, there, and he's also served as chair of the European Safety and Reliability Association uh, and president of the Society for Risk Analysis Worldwide. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I, I would like to, I hope that you're really open for some discussion about the foundations of uncertainty and risk analysis. Are you? Are you ready for some in-depth reflections? You know, I, <laughs> I, I, was, I was sort of planning for this and uh, this, this talk. And first of all, I was happy that I was invited to having this talk here. Because you have maybe seen that I'm, you know, Two years ago, I studied the EFSA document quite thoroughly. And to be honest, I was not happy with the quality of that document on uncertainty analysis. And I, what should I do about it? I was thinking, should I just forget it? Or should I speak up and say, this is not good enough? This is not according to high-level risk science, uncertainty science. What should I do? And I said to myself, yeah, I have to speak up. I'm a risk scientist. I'm an uncertainty scientist. I have to speak up. And the fact that I'm invited here, uh, I, I wrote this paper then in, in the risk, Journal of Risk Research, as you see, where I was trying to explain the reasoning why I'm coming to these conclusions. Of course, there are a lot of positive things about this document and sort of addressing uncertainties is, of course, positive, but I also had this kind of critique. And then, sort of, they invited me, the organizers. That must mean that they have, I must applaud them for having a fine balance between confidence and humbleness. They believe in something, yeah, of course they do. But also they are humble, open for discussion and potentially improvement. And that's the only way, I would say, that is the, I mean, for making progress and development, we need to have that attitude, that balance between humbleness and confidence. So thank you for that. And I will go into a little more into details. Uh, and we will see if you agree in, uh, with me about some of the issues. I will try to be crystal clear so that you can either be agreeing or not. So we get some discussion. The, the, the idea here was to get some sort of, uh, I mean, there are silos in these areas, uncertainty analysis, risk analysis, whatever, a lot of schools. And we never talked really together and look into the arguments. Everybody are happy within their own world. That's not good. And I'm, my dream and my vision is that risk uncertainty science is broadly recognized as a science, per se, a distinct science. That's my dream. Also coming into school, only then we can make really progress. I mean, we're talking about problems in communication. Yeah, that's fine. But I think we should start with ourselves. We talk. And it talks a lot of, uh, I would say, you look at it from the moon, different camps say that, they say that, they say that. And it's not really clear what this, uh, these areas of uncertainty and risk is actually saying. Then we are talking about people. Can they be expected to appreciate this? No, they cannot. We can't expect that because we, uh, scientists, communities, we are not really delivering. So I'm, I'm sort of questioning back to us. We are not de de delivering. We don't do a good enough, good enough job. And we have, we have an important role to play in order to, I mean, in order to other sciences to understand really what the limitations are of these sciences and how uncertainties and risks come into play. 
We need guidance on that, but it's not straightforward, and we haven't done the job. That's my <coughs> statement. Not only, I mean, these organizations here are in the whole field. We have a job to be done. That was the start. <laughs> but, okay, uh, let me see here if I can move on. Yeah, so I'm saying that the EFSA document lack a proper risk uncertainty platform, a basis, and therefore we have problems in that document. For example, the concept of probability is the key instrument we have for understanding and communicating sort of uncertainties. But it's not explained. It's poorly explained, I would say, and come back to it. How can we then have success? We cannot. It will fail, is what I'm saying. These are quotes from the paper that you should read. So, but before I go into that a little uh, about probabilities, let me make some comments about this distinction between uncertainties and risk. Uh, you heard about, and you have heard about Frank Knight's distinction between uncertainties and risk, 1921, that risk is the situation when you have objective distributions and uncertainties when that's not the case. Wow. If that would be the case, the risk world would be this little tiny world. The risk world, only when you have objective distributions, when do you have that? I mean, the, the, the distinction is, is okay, but please don't call risk for the situations of objective distributions. So when I'm going to eat um, some food, I don't face risk. Or if I'm thinking about uh, security uh, situations, I'm not facing risk. Or uh, climate change risk doesn't exist. What is that? That's, it's not according to intuition and the fields of science of risk and uh, the journals we have, none are in line with that kind of definition. So please, can you promise me, don't use this. But of course, there are different schools. And, and maybe the uncertainty school like to have their, their area big and the risk, me, uh, risk field small. But it is not really in line with sort of, I mean, what you normally say concerning risk. So what I see people doing is to use this definition and then the next sentence, I talk about risk in a much different, in different way. So, forget it. That's my conclusion on that. And I would say, modern risk thinking, modern risk thinking has, uncertainty is a key component of risk. When you're facing a sort of risk, uncertainty is a key component. And that, that is really, in my opinion, sort of also opening up for sort of collaboration between uncertainty and risk fields. We are not sort of in competition. We need to be together and sort of, because we're dealing with the same things, basically. Because if you have some uncertainties and they are big, is it a problem? Only if the impact or consequences are high that uncertainty is, is important. And then you're into the risk world. <laughs> so, we are friends. We are good friends. So let me try to explain how I would say is current thinking about risk, to explain the concept. I think we all agree that you can measure or describe risk in many different ways. And if you would like to define risk by a measurement, you will never agree. I mean, we will never agree. But if you look back that, behind that, and look into the basic idea concerning the risk concept, I think I will argue there's broad consensus what it's all about. And this is sort of, sort of a framework from society risk analysis, which is very generic and sort of showing the ideas. And there are two main components of risk. It's consequences with respect to something that is important for us, and it's uncertainties. So you have an activity, 
uh, I would like to eat some food, just activity. The life in a Berlin, the life in a country, the life on the planet, an investment, whatever activity. And that activity leads to some, in the future, some consequences. Some events with some effects, outcomes. Okay? So looking in the future, these are uncertain. You don't know what will happen in the future. And of course, when talking about risk, there will always be something negative. But you don't know in sort of at, at the time you're looking at it, if that will be the result. It could also be a positive outcome. So we're facing uncertainty. We're facing risk. This is so broad and cover basically everything. But the question is then, how big is the risk? How big is it? Then you need to specify the events, the consequences. And we come into describing the uncertainties. We come into that. And that's the next question. And this conference is focusing on how to express uncertainty. So then the question is, what is, what is sort of the answer to that? How should we do that in principle? Should we use probability to express uncertainties? Some would say, that's, that's it. Yeah, we use probabilities. Is that really good enough? Is it OK? to use probabilities, and, and we are happy to describe uncertainties? What do you say? Is it OK to just use the probabilities? Some people argue like that. The probabilities are sort of sufficient for describing uncertainties. I would say no. <coughs> I would say there are three dimensions to think about. And that's we use probability or probability intervals. That I put into that category, probability. Then we have the knowledge, because probability is conditional on some knowledge. This knowledge could be more or less strong. I mean, you can have a situation with the same numbers, but in one case, very strong knowledge support, and one very weak. Shouldn't that be reflected in a decision-making context? It has to. And also, what is knowledge, actually? What is knowledge? It is basically beliefs, justified beliefs. They can be wrong. You can get surprises. That is important to address also. It's difficult, yeah, but it has to be addressed. You know this uh, metaphor, uh, black swan? This is a beautiful metaphor, uh, and I know it, the, the idea go back some 300 years at least. You know, this, uh, we, we in the old world, Europe, all believed that all swans were white. And a dust expedition go to Australia and discover there are black swans. Where are the people from Australia? Are they here? Yes. I mean, it was a surprise for us. Not for them. Because they are used to black swans. I think there are only black swans there, I think. I'm not sure. But so it was a surprise for us relative to our knowledge. So the, the knowledge was there, but we didn't have it here in the old world 300 years ago. So that aspect is also an aspect of risk that we should take into account. How do we do it? Knowledge is not static, so it can be improved. I mean, we can look for these unknown knowns. Somebody has the knowledge, but we don't have it. Look for signals and warnings. We can do something about it. It's hard to express. If you are restricting your analysis to quantification, you are in big trouble here. Do the EFSA document discuss these issues? I'm sorry, they don't do it very well. They should have done it. I have to be honest about these things. And I think that there can be a lot to be said about this, but you need to address it. If you provide guidance on how to deal with uncertainties, you have to address these issues. So we go into probability. Is probability one thing? No, it's, it's, we use the term for many, sort of, many, many types of phenomena. We use it to reflect variation, and we go into frequency probabilities and probability models. 
Everyone knows that we have learned in school. Yes. Also for subjective probabilities and imprecision. And uh, you know, our friend Scott Furson. Where are you? He left. Okay, then I can talk freely. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, he has done a lot of work trying to, to sort of um, highlight the importance of the imprecision part. Uh, okay, I can, I can have a story about him. Uh, it's a friendly story. You know, I submitted a paper in, some 10 years ago about these issues to risk analysis. You know. And uh, actually, he um, turned out to be an opponent. No, not opponent, but reviewer for that paper. And uh, I can tell you that was quite interesting because he wrote, he said in, in the response, my name is Scott Furson. This is, should not be said, but he, he did it. And I think, I know that you are Ty Arvin. <laughs> okay. And then he come up with 25 pages of comments. <laughs> so detailed. Everything I wrote, and he said, I really love your paper, but disagree with you on everything. <laughs> Basically everything. Even I, he used one page on criticizing me for using the term dice. I mean, yes, I'm, I, I use an English pro to, to look at it, because I'm not native. But Scott had one page to write about my use of the die. He's really sharp. But the main thing is that he was going into discussion about what are these concepts? So I wrote back 50 pages <laughs> on trying to fight him back on all the aspects that he was covering. It was very cool. And, they, and the editor-in-chief put everything on the web because it was interesting for others, he said. Yeah, I agree. And I think we have developed over the years. Scott and I uh, were sort of seemingly disagreeing. But I then, we had a workshop in the US uh, the year after, and we, we saw that, okay, it's not that big difference. I think we're agreeing on the basic ideas, and I think we have developed. And I think that this is how the science and an, an area really develop is to have this kind of discussions, and you really go into the details and see what is it really? Are we really disagreeing? And I think we have developed from 2009 to today. I think that these are, uh, again, they are friends. We need imposition intervals. We use it all the time. Even if you are believing in subjective probabilities, there's no conflict in this. We need, need them all. So I think this is really saying also that there is an uncertainty risk science that is generic for all the applications to take from and learn from. You don't need to start from scratch if you're an application area. There is something generic that we can learn from. So let's take it slowly now. This type of probabilities we every, all of us know. If you have a pin or die or something like that, it's the fraction of time you get success if you do this experiment over and over again. That is frequency probability, probability models. That's simple. We learn that in school, and we come into unknown, these are unknown, these parameters, the P, and we do estimation, it's statistics. It's well known, it's boring. I, I, I'm coming from that background myself. I think that's trivial, easy to do. It's well established. Don't feel bad about it. Since I'm, I'm also a statistician, sort of from education, I can say this. It, it's important uh, uh, sort of to learn this, but it's not really covering all aspects we're dealing with in risk uncertainty in the real world, I would argue. So what is subjective probability then? Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about this all the time. Subjective probabilities, or what we call it, expressing uncertainty. But what is it? How do you interpret it? Every concept we have in a risk, in a scientific context, need to be defined and provided uh, having an interpretation. But I haven't heard any interpretation of this. It's been referred to a lot, these kind of probabilities, but no one really explained what it means. How can we then be, say, good in communication? Even among sort of experts in this environment here, we talk about it, but I often ask people to come up with their solutions, but we don't have time for that. 
But think about it. What would you have said if you had been asked now to present what is your interpretation of a subjective probability? Don't go to the EFSA document and get help there. That's my advice. I'm sorry to say it, because it's not explained, but it's indicated something like that. In some sort of, I, I hope I'm not too negative in sort of referring to this document. As I said, a lot of positive things I have to, uh, but, but I like to, to, to really face these issues that we, that we are facing here. And uh, what is it? Is this kind of, is this what we would like to, to, to sort of present as the answer to what is subjective probability? I mean, if you say that the, the probability is 10%, do you then mean that you are indifferent between getting 0.1 euro or playing a game where you get one euro if the uh, event occurs or is true and zero otherwise? Is that what you should think about subjective probability? is often referred to. In the economy literature, that's the one used, and people refer to it. Is, in an uncertainty context, is that what we should do? I say, no way. This is a mixture of, it's what I wrote in the abstract, this is no way, this is mixing uncertainty and value judgment, how you like money. This is not allowed. You should separate your uncertainty judgments and your value judgments. So, forget that. That's a tough statement. But I have to do it, uh, because it just keep on. And if the guidance document is sort of saying, this is the way to do it, wow. That's poor guidance, I have to say. So, what, is then the, what should you then do? You have studied Bayesian, Bayesian literature. One of the strongest sort of Bayesian sort of person I ever met is Dennis Lindley from UK. Wow, what a personality. He was a strong advocate of, of Bayesian theory. And he said, this is the one, this is the way to think about it. He's also going back to the famous paper by Kaplan Garrick in 1981 in, in, in quantification of risk. Look at this. It's a comparison. If the probability is 95%, it means that you have the same uncertainty, degree of belief for this event to be occurring or being true, statement being true, as drawing a red ball out of an urn, having 95 red balls and 100 balls all together. It's a comparison. Everybody understand what this means? It's simple. Have you heard about this? Many have, but surprisingly, many have not, and they're not referring to it. This is an elegant theory, and you can go to Dennis Lindley and his books. Elegantly framed, perfect, but people don't use it. And what about imprecision then? Imprecision is that you're not willing to be more precise in the interval? Yeah, you can use that kind of framework also then. You simply don't specify. You're not willing to be more precise than saying that it's at least 95%? Is it greater than or equal to 95%, as they now explain? Or you refer to an urn with 95 or more red balls, but you're not precise, not willing to be more precise in specifying how many, 95, 96, 97, 100. So you have explained the concepts. You have a framework that works. So the probabilities are always conditional on some knowledge, remember this, as I talked about in the beginning. Can we specify probabilities? In some, is it possible in all cases? I often read in papers that we can't specify probabilities in these cases, but we can always. Subjective probabilities can always be specified. But is, there are some problems, and that's, that's I'll just jump to, to this one, uh, because we are coming to the end. This is important. So we have knowledge supporting a probability or probability intervals. Yes, is this, are these P, or probability intervals, okay? Are these objective or subjective? They are certainly subjective. I mean, the knowledge could be a statement of an expert saying something. It could be really poor, but still, 
knowledge that you're using in your analysis. But why is then uh, our friend Scott Thurston so eager to, to talk about imprecise probabilities, interval probabilities, and not only specified probabilities? He would like the transformation from the K to the P to be more objective. If you have some knowledge, you like to transform that to the P in a more objective way. You don't like to add something which is not in the K. But that doesn't mean that it's, it's sort of, it's still subjective, but transformation from K to P is more objective than using intervals. So I will come to the end. Looking at that, the food is safe if, what, what, how should we make that kind of judgments? I would say probability, probability interval statements, and also about the knowledge supporting that statement, that these probabilities. You need to have both. And now I'm coming to the end. Yeah, that's my last slide, actually. So thank you. I'm very relieved to see that we, uh, we agree. You agreed? Uh, yes. Good. Uh, uh, we just, uh, sadly, we chose a poor metaphor. We, we chose an unfortunate metaphor when trying to explain probability, and we also were asked to keep that section extremely short. Very good. So, any questions? Ah, try speaking loudly. <laughs> Uh, don't you think that the, um, mm, the idea of the black swans could become the, an excuse for some to give up on trying to quantify the risk of the, about the identified system? Yeah. Uh, I, I often hear this kind of idea that you, have, you just refer to a black swan, so you didn't need to do anything. It's an excuse for poor management. But. This is exactly the opposite of what I'm saying, that you should, you should address uh, this type of risk issues. You can have surprises. And it's not talking about unknown unknowns, never heard about. I talk more about that things are ignored because of very low probability judgments or unknown knowns. You didn't have the knowledge, but others have it. So you should always strive to get that kind of improved knowledge and also improve your risk assessment. Yes. Good question. One up there at the back. Does it work? Yes. Um, you said when you had the introduce this concept which is now showing on this slide you said there are three dimensions probability knowledge and I guess black swans surprises yeah surprises, ah, surprises. okay yeah, yeah, but that's the, yeah, yeah and just to clarify I don't have a knowledge you know example of the swan does it mean knowledge is the knowledge from 300 years ago say that people know there are white swans so this is what you mean with yeah. knowledge yes Okay, then the surprise, well then, that there are black yeah, swans. But, okay, that, that's a good point, because I didn't actually go into very much about what is the knowledge, because and that also relates to this new subsystem we heard about yesterday, because when you have an, a judgment about the probability being a sort of 10% or less than 10%, you're basing it on, for example, assumptions. Are they reasonable? You're looking into, for example, um, amount of data. Are they relevant? You're looking into different experts. You're looking into, have you scrutinized your, uh, your, your, your knowledge? And so forth. So that kind of judgment, I think you need to have some judgment of the strength of the knowledge. That's the one part. But that judgment is a judgment, and you can still be surprised. So that's the point, yeah. Matthias? Uh, one, maybe we can be a bit more specific or down down to the ground here, we don't have to speak about black swans rather than, I mean, when we do risk assessment for food safety, for instance, we suppose a lot of knowledge is already there, it's been standardized, we did it like this for 50 yeah. years and so on, and I even seem to remember that in the EFSA guidance you have this standardized assessment scheme where you don't have to sort of communicate the uncertainties with that standard system. 
anymore. And uh, this is maybe a problem. I would like to hear your opinion. For instance, yeah. some people question the species barrier, whether our animal results are really meaningful, and so on and so forth. I think there are a lot of challenges in relation to sort of how to deal with this uh, aspects of, of surprises and black swan, how to, to incorporate that. I think that is a research challenge, how to do it properly. But I think that, first of all, you need to acknowledge this is an issue. This is about risk. And the next question is, how should we deal with it? I think that is, I don't say that I have the solution on how we do it, but acknowledging that surprise, the unforeseen, for us, as the analyst, is an issue we need to take seriously. It's important. That's why we have cautionary, precautionary thinking also, robustness, resilience thinking, because we have this kind of potential for surprise. Okay? Okay, last question from our host before coffee. Ah, thank you very much. Um, one of the first slides you, you showed uh, inactivity, uncertainty, yeah. and then outcomes. I wonder, in your uncertainty, how much uh, would contribute the, the uncertainty about causation to that uncertainty? Because there may be many, many factors. I wonder what systems do you study? Would that be a major source of uncertainty? My guess is where maybe, the, maybe where yeah. we have to account for the subject yes. area is yes. in many of our cases in food safety, uh, we have a activity yeah. is exposure to some chemical outcome at, at the end of some cancer. And I, I think yes. that um, the yeah. causation is one of the major, major uncertainty. And obviously, this is, where, this is an area where we are not yet really able very much to handle this type of uncertainty. And I just want to challenge you. Are you better equipped in your studies to, to, to actually uh, be clear about the causation? Fighting back, that's good. Uh, yeah, but I think I, I agree with you. That's a really important source. And in that framework, it didn't really capture that very well because you're just looking into the consequences. And I said events and effects and the links between them. That is basically causality. And that's a huge area which I didn't cover at all. That's a challenge, of course, but I didn't actually touch it. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank again all the speakers in this session.